also like Val, I'd like to uh, thank PIDS for allowing me um, to uh, write this um, chapter, uh, especially thanks to former president, uh, Dr. Celia, for um, giving me this, this uh, big chance to chronicle what happened to the Philippine economy during the pandemic. Okay, so this, um, okay, sorry. So this is how our chapter looks like. Uh, the, the title is Navigating the COVID-19 Storm, Impact of the Pandemic on the Philippine Economy and Micro Responses of Government. We tackle several areas uh, such as the effect on the economy, uh, how the crisis looks like in perspective to previous crisis, looks at uh, macro responses of government to the crisis, and then gives a short review of the monetary fiscal policy combination during the pandemic crisis and sort of lays a path forward. Now, I just like uh, to uh, note that this chapter was written actually first quarter of 2021. So if, if some of the um, materials being dated, um, it's because it's, it was written in Q1. And so here for this presentation, I sort of uh, try to um, crystallize what what uh, is useful going forward, uh, despite uh, sort of the, the, the data uh, being cut uh, in the first quarter of 2021. Okay, so um, the, for the first part, I just uh, for I just give you like to give you the highlights. If you want uh, a longer discussion, it's all in the book. All the graphs or all, all the uh, details will be in the book. So I'll just give snapshots of what are the main uh, findings or main highlights of the chapter. So in terms of the economic impact of the pandemic, I, I there were five impressions uh, that were sort of uh, indicative of what happened during the time. We had the deepest crisis in post-war history because we had a pandemic standstill. Uh, we had lockdowns, um, there was social distancing, etc. So we, ha we had the deepest crisis we ever had. We had a rare collapse in services. We had a breakdown in household sp spending. We had a mixed impact on inflation and we had um, severe job and income insecurity. Okay, so this is the graph of GDP growth. So if you can see, this is from 1950 to, to 2020. So if you can see it, uh, the COVID uh, recession was really the deepest. The next deepest was way back in the mid 1980s where you had uh, both a debt crisis and a political crisis. So you had a, a simultaneous debt and political crisis and uh, GDP dropped by 7% during that time. Here in COVID-19 uh, pandemic, you had a pandemic standstill and uh, GDP dropped by 9.6%. Uh, now, to um, what is the reason for this drop? Um, on the part of, on the industry side, it's really because of a rare collapse in services. Now, the services sector used to be less than 50% of GDP, but starting 1990s onward, it accounted for about uh, close to 60% or around 60%. And so uh, with services dropping by 9.2%, so you can see in the draft, graph that services dropped by 9.2%, this means that your 9.6% uh, drop in GDP, a large part of that over six percentage points is really due to a uh, drop in services. So again, if you look at it historically, the deepest drop in services goes back to the to the 1980s, to the mid 1980s. In 1984, when services dropped by 6.1 percent, we also had uh, on the expenditure side, we also had a rare collapse in household spending. So household uh, spending also accounts for uh, for a large uh, part of aggregate demand, about uh, maybe 70 percent. So again, a large part of the 9.6% drop is due to a household spending drop of about 7.9%. Um, now this one is the most sort of uh, phenomenal because we've never never really seen household spending drop by this much. Um, if ever it dropped, it was only about 0.5%, and that was way back again in the mid 1980s. 
Okay. Uh, now, if you look at the impact of the pandemic on inflation, uh, this is where you will see how you do not have your regular crisis. Okay. Re this is really not your regular crisis. This is not a crisis that is due to financial excess. It is a mixture of both a sup negative supply shock and a negative demand shock. And you will see that in your inflation, if you have a supply shock, then you will see supply bottlenecks. You will see um, output going down at the same time that prices are going up. And you will see that particularly in your transport service. Uh, we will show you the, the summary later. Now, if you have a demand shock, okay, remembering your macroeconomics, you are moving along the supply curve, which means that there's a consumption decline and there's a price deceleration if you have a negative demand shock. And we see that in the sectors that are high contact centers, sectors, they are contact intensive. So they're the ones that are now being uh, restricted. So these are your sectors such as your restaurants and hotels, recreation and culture, clothing, footwear, education, et cetera. Okay, of course there are other factors to inflation such as the impact of the, um, uh, the rice certification law, which has helped bring down um, um, rice prices. And also the fact that oil prices are going down uh, due to the pandemic. So here is a graph showing you uh, the movement of inflation Q3 versus Q1 in 2020 and the change in household spending. So you can see if you look at the transport sector, you can see the two bars, the blue bars and the red bar going in opposite direction. So that's where you have a supply shock. And we know why that happened is because the public utility uh, vehicles were not allowed to ply. And so there were other, uh, like the tricycles had to sort of fill the gap. And so you saw uh, prices of fares going up. And then you, have, you distinctly see demand declines in sectors that are high contact, such as your restaurants and your, and your hotels, where both the blue bar and the red bar are moving in the same direction, uh, meaning uh, leftward. So you have see that in education, recreation, uh, et cetera. Okay. And of course, you also see other sectors that uh, have um, um, spending going up, such as in communication. Okay. So the, that's for inflation. So uh, the dark legacy, I, I, I sort of call it the dark legacy, the really big impact of COVID is on income and jobs, incomes and jobs. Okay, there was high insecurity. Uh, there were four, I think, impressions that I uh, sort of picked up on. One was that it was only agriculture, which saw a sizable gain in number of workers during the pandemic in 2020. Um, jobs were lost in construction and services, and these were especially in domestic trade um, and vehicle repair, uh, transport and storage, accommodation and food. Uh, then you had sustained employment growth only for own account workers, those without family farms or business or any paid employee. You also saw sustained, sustained decline in the number of wage and salary workers particularly those in private establishments. So about 5.5 million jobs were lost during the time. Okay, so looking at the COVID-19 pandemic crisis in perspective, essentially what I wanted to look at was how different was it in terms of how vulnerable we were during when, that, when, the, when the pandemic crisis happened. So we have to qualify it. It was really a rare public health shock that came during a time of uninterrupted growth and relatively good macro fundamentals. So that was the good part. And the good part also was that we seem to have learned our lessons. So from the mid 1980s, debt and political crisis, the lesson was a need for disciplined public sector. And we learned from that episode that we needed to keep our deficits and our debt at sustainable levels. Okay, no profligacy, uh, let's, uh, let's have, you know, uh, a well-functioning um, fiscal system, uh, etc. From the Asian financial crisis, the lesson was the importance of a disciplined financial sector. Okay, so from that crisis came a, number, a wave of regulatory reforms. We had greater exchange rate flexibility after that. And we also learned to somehow 
accumulate our so somehow build our reserves in 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 a, in the event of another crisis. So the good news was that the Philippines entered the crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, with a healthy financial sector. Our banks had low uh, NPLs. We had high reserves, uh, FX reserves. Our deficits were controlled. We had low public and especially low external debt. So unlike past crisis, uh, the country did not have to deal with the peso free fall and high inflation rates. Instead, we had external surpluses, peso appreciation, and mild inflation up to the end of the year, 2020. So to summarize the bright areas during the pandemic were an experimental surplus, currency stability, moderate inflation, and a surprise was the surprising acceptance of financial markets of alternative forms of financing. And here I'm talking specific, specifically about the short-term lending arrangement between the central bank and the national government. Now, again, we talk about COVID-19 being different. So I'll just go very quickly into this and how different it was from the other crisis. So from, we know from our textbook crisis, we're familiar with the, with the financial boom and bust, and then there are banks become weak and they can't lend. And so you have your financial sector crisis becoming a real sector crisis. Here, it's not that. It's, a, it's not a financial crisis. It's a complex combination of aggregate supply and aggregate demand shocks. It's uh, the feature is really sectoral shutdowns. You have sectors that are closed. So the closed sector, it has complementary sectors. And if the closed sector, uh, well, if it's closed, then the complementary sector will also weaken. And the complementary sectors uh, that are complementary to the complementary sectors will also weaken. So, the, so this will now spread. So even if you have an aggregate supply shock, it eventually becomes an aggregate demand uh, deficient uh, recession. So that's why you call it a Keynesian supply shock. It's a supply sh negative supply shock that morphs into negative demand shocks. Okay, so in that case, you have uh, sectors that are shut down, and therefore uh, the usual way you attack a crisis is, is cannot really be uh, the case because if you're talking about fiscal spending, fiscal multipliers in a pandemic are not working because sectors are shut down, it's particularly in shutdown sectors while on lockdown. Okay, so that's the sort of uh, looking at the nuts and bolts of the crisis. And I thought of putting together a pandemic policy primer. So I'll just go quickly. This is based on the literature, based on what I've read, what, I've, what uh, the theoretical uh, literature is there. So one, swift and strong policy action is critical in any crisis. Number two, you should treat the pandemic as you would a natural disaster because analytically they are the same. And how do you treat that? You treat that with ample relief spending. So Krugman 2020 is the one uh, um, the most vocal about this. The risk of negative financial markets below its remains, and therefore you can use standard monetary policy, uh, for instance, policy rate cuts to offset the decline in, in market risk tolerance, or you could use even non-standard policy, such as large-scale asset purchases, to transfer some of the risk to the government. Optimal policy, be, policy, be, policy would be to combine monetary loosening with abundant social protection for workers in closed sectors. So this is what you can do in the relief stage. In the recovery stage, there is less emphasis on traditional fiscal policies for the time being, and you only use them when the multipliers start to function again, meaning when your economy starts to open. Okay, not, uh, so the problem with this list is this, sorry, this list, it's a sort of a whatever it takes uh, uh, approach. It is not feasible for developing countries. Not all policy prescriptions uh, mentioned may be feasible in countries that have weaker systems for healthcare and social protection services and which have more constrained fiscal space. The trade-off between flattening the infection curve and flattening the recession curve is harsher in developing countries because of the institutional capacity, the limited capacity and greater vulnerability. Ideal solution is you want to nip it the bud, you soften the trade-off early through prompt containment efforts and widespread testing and tracing. Otherwise, you have to resort to blanket lockdowns. 
But even blanket lockdowns, there are alternative to blanket lockdowns when the infection risk is not at its peak. You could instead use targeted policies for different age and risk groups and then use testing, isolation, and the like uh, as complementary measures. Okay, so um, actually, Louise and Peddings from the World Bank already have a primer, and I think this is pretty much what the government has, uh, has followed, where you delineate relief and recovery. So there's a relief phase and a recovery phase, and then you have these um, measures uh, that are appropriate for each phase. So if when you're in relief mode, you spend for public health care, you support your workers, you support your households, you support your small businesses, you do standard monetary uh, easing. If you're in the recovery phase, that's the only time that you start to use uh, like fiscal stimulation. So you switch from crisis management to macro stimulation. Okay, in countries where the multipliers and transmission mechanisms are weak, you can have alternative goals such as avoid simply avoiding procyclicality, uh, continue just simply continue provision of public goods and services, including health care, and just simply aim for macro stability. Okay, so this is a very nice way of looking at it. The problem is you cannot really tell when you are in relief and when you are in recovery. Sometimes the virus is so uncertain, the path of the virus is so uncertain that you cannot really tell. So there's no clear line between relief and recovery for as long as there's uncertainty about COVID-19. And the sensible goal would be to simply alleviate the harsh effects of the pandemic while trying to prevent amplification of shocks. So you don't want the, the, risk, the, the crisis to become a financial crisis, in other words. So again, this is another interesting area. We have two uh, main authors here, and they're basically, I won't explain it, you can read the book, but basically what they're saying is that this time, you are not going to amplify the crisis through the financial sector. It will be amplified through corporate balance sheets, meaning uh, the companies that have reduced uh, uh, cash flow, they lose their workers and they close, and therefore that's going to affect your economy. So the goal in a pandemic is to evergreen SMEs. You prevent inefficient bankruptcy. So this links to the economic scoring because uh, one feature of economic scarring is business closures. So the small businesses that you know can survive the pandemic, you try to keep them alive. And you try to do that through ample uh, financing programs. Okay, so that's... Uh... So uh, again, if for some countries this may have uh, limited success because of continued uncertainty and credit heightened credit risk so even if you if you loosen let's say monetary policy the the borrowers might you know the the households and the, the firms sorry might not borrow and so uh, you could have other ways you know, so what you want to do is lower the risk in in the in the economy and so you do do that by transferring some of the risk to government to government balance sheets through capitalization of state-owned banks, scale up of credit guarantee programs, large scale purchases of portfolios of loans, et cetera. Okay. So um, reviewing in reviewing the monetary and fiscal policy responses, I just like to take note of some things. One, the COVID-19 crisis is still essentially a public health crisis. So it really demanded a strong public health response for a robust economic recovery. Now, macro fundamentals remain important, even if it had been powerless to prevent a recession. So the, the argument there is really just a counterfactual. What if we had the pandemic when we also had poor macro fundamentals? Asset programs of EMEs were a surprising game changer. They lowered financial sector risk and provided le leaders uh, breathing space. So this is the market acceptance. Uh, as I said, of the lending arrangements between uh, government and their central banks. So, so far, the country has been able to maintain an image of fiscal responsibility and fundamental strength, only one negative outlook in 2020. But a protracted struggle to contain the pandemic makes it harder to continue this balance of protecting the vulnerable and shoring up the economy given the limited fiscal resources that we have. So this, this is a list of, I won't discuss it 
it's in the book. It, uh, this is a list of the monetary response of government. So you have four categories, measures that uh, support liquidity, measures that are meant to provide regulatory relief for, for the financial institutions, uh, measures that are intended to support MSME lending and other NG support measures such as remittances uh, of uh, BSP uh, advanced to the national government. And again, this uh, agreement between uh, the national treasury and government, okay, short-term lending of the, of the BSP to the national government. For the fiscal response, again, uh, we have four types to its relief. So the first phase, this one comes in phases. There's the relief phase, uh, which is mostly Bayanihan 1. There's the relief and recovery phase, Bayanihan 2. Then you have the reset rebound recover, which is in the national budget of 2021. And then you have CREATE, which is a supply side stimulus uh, of the government. So, um, so again, it's in the book if you want to see the details. So I just give a quick review overall in terms of monetary response, the positive side of it. Overall, the country has been able to put together an appropriate set of monetary responses based on the conceptual framework provided. Ample liquidity has helped relieve market stress and avert financial instability. We've seen that happen. Uh, regulatory relief has lessened the pressure on financial institutions, and policy has correctly focused on MSMEs and households. In terms of fiscal response, the positives are is that except for the permanent tax cuts, the country's fiscal response has pretty much followed the accepted playbook with proper sequencing of relief and recovery measures. The initial aim was to provide relief to workers, households, and businesses through Bayanihan 1 at the height of the crisis. They shifted to a more tar targeted approach under Bayanihan 2 and incorporated more stimulus elements in the 21, 2021 budget. So they also correctly focused on households and firms through cash transfers and grants, payments relief, and tax exemptions uh, and deductions. Okay, so now we go to the negative side of it. From the monet on the monetary side, financial conditions collapsed during the pandemic, uh, looking at liquidity, stress, and risk. Credit standards tightened, credit demand weakened. So what the BSP did was correctly so, they tried to inject liquidity. So about uh, 1.9 trillion or 9.6% was injected into the financial system by mid-October 2020. But uh, as of time of writing, around uh, 1.5 trillion or greater was actually lodged in the liquidity management facilities of the central bank. So this was despite efforts to support domestic liquidity, it was going back to, to, the, to their own uh, management uh, liquidity. So the banks, why, why is this so? Banks were worried about their balance sheets and bottom lines. And of course, they would want to seek haven in risk-free instruments, which were offered also by the BSP. So they also were, you could also see that kind of behavior in their bid to, to set aside uh, provisions for loan losses in order to protect themselves against the weak economy. Okay, so, so as a result, policy observers <clears throat> saw this procyclical pro sorry, behavior of banks as evidence that the central bank was just pushing on a string. So this highlighted the need for a better balance between fiscal and monetary responses. Now, on the fiscal side, while the COVID-19 standing may seem unremarkable in the Asian context, the Philippines, as Dr. Celia said, really actually embarked on a, on a wide and um, an ambition, ambitious program in terms of proportion of population coverage. The problem was there was the, there were the expected glitches in trying to uh, deliver the social services. You had incomplete list of beneficiaries, absence of national ID system and a unified database. You had physical handling of cash, which made distribution unsafe in terms of infection and also prone to corruption and leakage. However, four piece related performance invites some optimism that yeah, you could uh, uh, improve a lot in that area, especially if you have digital digital delivery. Uh, traditional forms of public spending proved even harder. So following Bayanihan 1, public works were postponed and canceled 
while uh, limited operating capacity due to quarantines led to implementation delays of remaining projects. The public infra program was actually revised downwards in 2020 and actually fell by a fifth. Okay, and then the final point is that tax cuts in the fiscal package may not be, so this was as of time of writing, again, to qualify, may not be a major source of fiscal stimulus in the near term if you are faced with continued weakness of aggregate demand. So the full benefits of CREATE would be more likely in the longer term. So the key lessons, so I'm, now, I'm down to the key lessons. What are the key le lessons? One key lesson is remember the lesson. <laughs> so it's remember the past lessons. And we did that, and that is simply to say, you know, maintain economic fundamentals. Okay, follow a playbook. We've also seen that this will help plan and coordinate your macro responses. Okay, so you, we, we want to have a better balance next time of the fiscal monetary response. Um, then the third lesson is get lessons from the literature because they actually help. So some of, I think, the most important lessons in the literature that I saw were one by Ma et al. 2020, who said that countries with larger first year responses in government spending especially on healthcare, exhibited faster recovery. So that already shows you where to spend on. Then another by Guerrieri et al, which said that uh, social insurance or social protection for affected workers in closed sectors where or where social distancing is required is the best way to prevent Keynesian supply shocks triggering demand shortages. Um, in a pandemic crisis, shock amplification will likely be through corporate balance sheets due to sharp cash flow reductions, especially of small firms, and therefore the goal should be to prevent inefficient bankruptcies. Okay, and then finally, there's a growing body of research support that we already know about the quicker way out of a pandemic Keynesian slump. So this is your textbook uh, pandemic, i uh, sorry, textbook crisis. And you do that by raising investor confidence, consumer confidence, and by indirect uh, injection of demand. So how do you raise investor and consumer confidence in a pandemic? Well, through successful containment and vaccination. So we saw that. And then um, how do you directly inject demand? Again, the things that we have already done, such as provide cash grants, provide cheap credit or grants for small firms, especially those with sustainable businesses. Okay, so um, yeah, so the policy challenges moving forward, I sort of rewrote this for today because some of the things I wrote in the chapter uh, were fortunately seemed to have been listened to. And so I think uh, we have no problem in that area, but maybe the remaining issues is that uh, though uh, COVID-19 may eventually be considered endemic, developing countries, including the Philippines, would still need to prepare for a resurgence of the disease and possible emergence of another pandemic. Translate, you still need to invest in your healthcare system and make it stronger. Number two, policymakers will need to optimally time the country's exit strategy for COVID-19 support measures to minimize macroeconomic uh, risk. Uh, translation of that, is that don't pull out your measures too soon unless you are sure that uh, this, this will really not uh, destabilize yet the, uh, the economy. Okay, so you have to, uh, and again, the BSP has been very vocal about their evidence-based uh, approach. Uh, there are really two things that uh, people are looking out for. One is, what happens when you take away forbearance measures? And number two is what uh, what happens um, if the uh, the arrangement between the national government and uh, uh, and um, BSP the lending arrangement is is ended. And I think we've seen good endings in that regard. Number three, the government will have to act to avert the risk of economic scarring due to a protracted pandemic crisis, but it will also need to have a sound fiscal strategy to maintain macroeconomic stability. So also related to number uh, two, 
uh, it means that we still need to spend. Actually, we do need to spend because we're coming out of a pandemic and we have what they call economic scarring. We have to know the extent of that scarring and we have to address that scarring. OK, but at the same time, we have high debt. Uh, OK, and so we need to signal to the market that we're doing what it what is needed to mend the economy, but at the same time, uh, we are going to keep our eye uh, on the on the fiscal picture. OK, so for Philippine recovery, I think uh, um, just to add to what uh, others in the government are already saying, I just like to boil it down to two key elements. One, uh, you have to nurse the economy back to health. OK, so again, do what it's needed to prevent scarring. Uh, the important areas for public spending are still social protection, health infrastructure, and education. Okay, so the other element is one should maintain, we should maintain investor and business confidence while doing so. Okay, so the main concerns of, are, of course, the fiscal picture, fiscal deficits and debt, possible, uh, you know, uh, concerns about misuse of, you know, uh, of, of of spending, okay, um, etc. Okay, that's all. Thank you.